If you have your Bibles this morning, I'd ask you to turn to Jonah chapter number 1. Uh, we'll start an expository uh, series this morning in the book of Jonah and go through it verse by verse. Uh, we will cover the first three verses today. The title of the series is, This is Much More Than a Smelly Fish Story. Amen? Uh, and it really is. So Jonah chapter number 1, verse number 1. And if you have found that in your Bible, I'd ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word in honor of the God of the Word. Jonah chapter number 1 and verse number 1. And the Bible says, <clears throat> Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going down to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come into your presence this morning and we're so thankful that you love us. God, we, we come and we gather around your word and we ask for the illuminating power and presence of your Holy Spirit uh, to uh, call us close to yourself, Lord. Father, that we would see ourselves maybe in Jonah's shoes and, uh, and, and Lord, that we would be willing to make the changes in our own lives, God, to be uh, Christ-honoring. Father, we pray today, if there's one that's lost that doesn't know you, today would be the day that they make the decision to trust Christ as their personal Savior. Father, if there are those of us here today who are following you at a guilty distance with sin in our life, we pray, God, that you would draw us close to yourself through repentance. God, encourage us, uh, bless us, strengthen us, help us, we pray, in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please take your seat. The title of today's message is The Daring Disobedience of Jonah. <clears throat> Jonah uh, was from a small town just about three miles from Nazareth. Uh, and this little book is an example of God, the creator of the universe, uh, using man to do his bidding here on earth. You know, that's what he does. Uh, Jonah was that man in this context. And, uh, and, and like us, often, uh, Jonah wanted things his way. He was disobedient even after the call and commissioning of God, and he decided that he was going to try to do things his own way, and he ran from God. Uh, we'd call this back where I come from, he had pooch mouth. Now, if you don't know what that is, you just kind of do like that and pucker your lips out, and that's kind of the way Jonah was. Now, we'll talk about later exactly why he was the way he was, uh, but nonetheless, he was that way, and he did not want to be obedient uh, to God. And uh, I don't know about you, I have been that way before, okay? And uh, I think all of us, if we were honest before God, would, uh, would raise both of our hands and our feet and get the dying cockroach position this morning and say that we've all been in that position at one time or another in our lives. Uh, but the good news is this, God didn't give up on us, amen? Nor did he give up on Jonah. So uh, one of the, the most important things about uh, the book we call Jonah, Jonah is not really the topic or subject of the book. God is the subject of the book. And we have to realize that and get a grip on that. However, <clears throat> understand that, uh, that Jonah was an actual person, and that is verified both in the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament. Uh, now, we, we know that the Bible says in 2 Kings 14, 25 and following, uh, he restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath, under the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord of, of Israel. And he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, uh, the son of Amittai, the prophet, uh, which was of Gath Heifer, as well as uh, the Lord Jesus in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For as Jonah was three days uh, and three nights in the whale's belly, so was the Son of Man, uh, so shall the, the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented, uh, they repented at the, the, the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Now, uh, when I look at the Word of God, and I pray that when you look at the Word of God, I try my best uh, to take a literal interpretation of the Scripture. Uh, I think it's of great importance that we understand that <clears throat> for two reasons. First of all, uh, the integrity uh, of Scripture really demands it. 
uh, and also uh, the, wor the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ are at stake here. Uh, so we must take a literal interpretation of the uh, infallible, inerrant uh, Word of God. And, and it's important that we do that. Now the liberals of the day uh, would come out and they would attempt to dispute uh, the little book of, of Jonah uh, and the reality thereof. And they would out, uh, that would, in fact, automatically cast doubt upon the Savior. Uh, if Jesus said it, I believe it, that finishes it. Amen? Oh, man. Uh, let me say that again. I said, if Jesus said it, I believe it, and that finishes it. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's a good jubilant place to say that. Now, uh, we, we speak of Jonah here, and, and Jonah speaks in the third person, and he tells us what happened when God calls him, uh, and uh, what he did when God uh, told him what he wanted to do. Uh, and like I said, sometimes, as sadly as it is, we sometimes act just like Jonah. Uh, but my prayer is today that, uh, that maybe if there's something blocking God's will in our life that we have done or we're thinking or, uh, or that we're doing, that we would, we would overcome that today. That we would uh, cry out to God and ask for His blessing in our life and, and we would go on not in carnality or cowardice, uh, but instead with courage, uh, trusting God to do what He called us to do for the glory of God. The first thing I want to talk about this morning is the call, of, uh, the call from God. Now, in dealing with that, we really have to deal with, with three ingredients. First of all, the oracle of God. Uh, the Bible <clears throat> uses the word uh, now to start out with, and, uh, and that really is just a time recorded in history for us, uh, a date stamp when uh, beginning to introduce Jonah and what all went on in his life. But it says, Now the word of the Lord came into Jonah, the son of Amittite, uh, saying, So, <clears throat> the oracle of God or the word of God, the oral or the, men, uh, the mental communication of God in this case, uh, carries with it the power to subdue mankind. Uh, that, that, and that really is what we see here. Uh, the, the word indicates God's thought and His will in Jonah's life. And as God would impress His oracle upon us through His word, it also impresses His will uh, upon our lives. Now, uh, the word Lord is also used in unison with the, uh, the word word, uh, but the Lord indicates uh, that God's person and presence uh, was behind the oracle of God. The, uh, the presence of God's word was there. His person was there. His power was behind the word as he began to speak to Jonah. And the word Lord itself means self-existent one. Uh, so we're talking about a God who created the universe, a God who sustains the universe, who, who condescended in word uh, down to speak to Brother Jonah and to get his attention and to call him uh, into the service that he had for him. And we see that as the oracle of God. But also the, the object of God's oracle is next. You see, God just didn't speak that out into the universe. He came down unto Jonah. He spoke unto Jonah. He came to Jonah. And this denotes really uh, the emotion uh, of energy being expended from God uh, to speak to Jonah on behalf of the Almighty God, the direction uh, that he would give to mankind, particularly for Jonah. It was God's will to communicate to Jonah. He didn't just, uh, just speak it on the radio and say, well, I hope somebody gets that. No, he pointed out Jonah. You know, the Bible teaches us that God knows our name. Uh, the Bible teaches us that the hairs on our head are numbered. The Bible teaches us uh, that the, the steps of a righteous man are ordered. Uh, that God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. He demonstrates that plan by a call on our life. We talked about that briefly last week. Talking about the call of salvation, the call of sanctification, and the call of service. God calls every one of us. And explicitly in the life of Jonah, he gave him an exact commandment on exactly what he wanted to do. So he came to Jonah. Now the word Jonah uh, means dove. Dove. And he was the son of a Mittai, uh, which means stability, uh, truth, certainty, trustworthiness. So we see that the oracle of God came unto the object of God's oracle, Jonah, and spoke to him. And the object of God's oracle is this, he came saying or speaking or impressing his will. Uh, so God, the self-existent one, moved and expended energy to speak uh, to Brother Jonah, uh, the son of Amittai, in person, in power, uh, and in presence, in order to impress his will upon Jonah's life. 
God was communicating, communicating clearly with Jonah. Now, God would be understood. He would be disobeyed, at least at first, but he would be understood. Uh, may I say today, God is still understood. Uh, we have a, a will in our life, and, and God speaks his will to us, and his will supersedes our will, overcomes our will, and we make a decision, a conscious decision, I will be disobedient or I will be obedient to God's will. Uh, but nonetheless, God places a call upon our life, just as he did our brother Jonah. Anytime we talk about the Word of God, I feel impressed to talk about three other uh, topics that go along with that. Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about the revelation uh, of the Word of God. You understand uh, that, that God's Word contains the revelation of God's will for us. Uh, God's revelation in the Word uh, is revealing to us the truths from God that we have no other way of finding out. Uh, listen, man has been trying to figure out creation from time immemorial when God spelled it out for us. Amen or oh me? Uh, we even question what came first, the chicken or the egg. But guess what? The Bible answers that question. And God created the fowl of the air. A chicken is a fowl. The chicken came first. God breathed the chicken into existence. You said, Brother Barry, that's a little oversimplified. Yes, it is. And it fits my mind just fine. How about yours? <laughs> Amen. Uh, so the bottom line is, uh, God's revelation is, uh, is the Word of God. Now, we have the Word of God. We have the written Word of God. And that brings us to the next point, the inspiration of God's Word. Uh, not only revelation, but we have the inspiration. You see, what happened was God breathed upon the hearts and lives of men uh, he used their geographical location, their personality. He used their social, economical status, and everything else you can imagine. And he calls them the pen, the 66 books of the Bible that we have. Uh, we call that inspiration, okay? So we have revelation of God's Word. We have the inspiration of God's Word uh, in written form, but we also have the illumination of God's Word. And that comes by the person of the Holy Spirit, uh, whereby God turns the light on in our finite minds. You see, the Bible teaches us we cannot understand God's Word aside the Spirit of God apply it to our hearts and lives. Uh, you see, so we have the inspiration uh, and the illumination. Uh, men penned it out according to God's will, uh, but also uh, we are illuminated by the Holy Spirit uh, as we read the Word of God. Now, I want to say this real quick, like, and I'll move on. Uh, we have the revelation of God in the 66 canonized books of the Bible you hold in your hand. Uh, now, that's not to say that there are not other historical writers that have told truths, but they are not the Word of God. Uh, listen, I don't believe we, we need the Apocrypha. I don't believe we need uh, the, the Book of Enoch. I don't we believe we necessarily need all those other books. Now, they might aid to our understanding, and they might give us some historical data that are even true. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what we need more than anything else in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today. Are you ready? Deep theological truth. The Word. Amen? The, the 66 books uh, of the Bible, the revelation of God, uh, inspired by God to be written out uh, that the Spirit of God can illuminate our hearts and minds with it. Now, moving right along from there, we see the call of God on Jonah's life. Next, we see the commissioning of a man. In verse number 2, and that really is uh, how that God gives his instructions for man to follow. Uh, and there's something else that we need to say there. I, I'm sorry, when I get up here, all these verses just keep cutting, flooding back, and I just can't get away from it. But in Romans chapter 11, verse 29, uh, the Bible says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Are you with me? The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. I just want you to store that back there in the mind somewhere as we go through the book of Jonah. Jonah doesn't give up. I mean, God doesn't give up on us. He didn't give up on Jonah. Uh, Jonah wasn't off the hook. <clears throat> Jonah, Jonah said, yeah, I'm not going to go. I'm going to hear, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do my will. But God said, uh-uh. We're going to keep bringing it up, brother. We're going to keep bringing it up. Why? Because the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. He speaks to us individually. He calls us individually. He gives us sovereignly. He gives us the gifts he wants us to have and utilize for the kingdom. So number one, the call of God, the oracle of God, the object of God's oracle, the objective of God by his oracle calling Jonah. Next, the commission of a man. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, cry against it, for the wickedness is, their wickedness is come up before me. First of all, God tells Jonah the first action to take. 
It was not take a break. Amen? It was not take a break. The first thing that God uh, said unto Jonah was arise. That means get up. That means get busy. That means do something for the glory of God. Arise. He had a purpose in his heart for Jonah to expend energy, to do something for the glory of God. Uh, if we will serve God, we must be prepared uh, to do something for His service. Amen? I thank God for those that will be cooking uh, our breakfast this evening. Amen? Uh, you know, I, I, I really uh, like the fact that we can come together and have a meal and, and enjoy that. And by the way, there will be a large group session uh, on discipleship after we eat. Uh, so hold on to, to your lunch. Eat well and don't take a nap. Um, but anyway, God tells Jonah the first action to take is to get up. And not only does God tell him what to do, but he tells him where to go. He said, go to Nineveh. Get up and go to Nineveh. May I ask you a question today? Where is your Nineveh? Where's your Nineveh? God is calling us all to service in one shape, form, or fashion of another. Where is your Nineveh? You have to, listen, if you don't know, you need to ask God. God, where is my Nineveh? Where am I supposed to be serving? So God, first of all, calls Jonah, and then he begins to commission him or giving him the direct instructions that he needs. He says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Now this, again, uh, is another point uh, for uh, the liberal media and other people to, to jump on board. Uh, they say that, well, Nineveh was a very small city. It wasn't a large city. Well, upon excavation of Nineveh, the first uh, time it was excavated, there was only nine miles found. Uh, but later they found out uh, that Nineveh was kind of like Atlanta. Uh, it had a, a series of communities attached to it uh, that were at least 60 miles in length, okay? Uh, so it was, in fact, a great city, a great city. So uh, God tells Jonah the first action to take, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and then he tells him what to do when you get there. He says, cry against it. Cry against it. Uh, really, we looked at David crying out to Goliath, and Goliath crying out uh, to David last week. Uh, they were across the valley, remember, and they were hollering at each other. And that's really what it says here. Now, I know that sometimes we share the gospel. We probably don't want to use a loud, boastful voice like I use, okay? Uh, but, but sometimes it helps, too, if they're going to sleep. You know, you don't have to go back and peck them on the shoulder or anything. You just kind of raise the volume a little bit. Everything's okay. Uh, Y'all wouldn't do that, I know. But, but God uh, tells Jonah what to do. He says, you've got to go cry against it. Now, what is he saying here? He's not, not just saying, uh, go use a loud voice. I mean, that's part of it, but that's not it. He says, do it in opposition to the culture. Uh, be opposed to the culture that you're entering into. That's what he says. Why? Because it was a sinful culture. Now, uh, I, I want to tell you, strategy is good. But I recently read this phrase, and I really like it. I've shared it with several of you. Culture eats strategy for lunch. Let me tell you what that means. That means we can have the best plan in the world to go forward, but if the heart of our people are not right, we'll never go anywhere for the glory of God. That's what it means. Because we have to change the culture. We have to have a, a Christ-like culture. Now, uh, Jonah was going to go in uh, to a city that was diametrically opposed to Jehovah God, the self-existent God. Uh, they, had, they were notorious for being against God. And, and you know what God told Jonah? He said, square your shoulders, get ready, and cry against it. He said, if need be, use a loud voice. But you go in there, don't worry about counterculture, uh, don't worry about cancel culture, uh, don't worry about any kind of culture. You just go in there and preach God. Uh, and, and really what Jonah was told to, to preach was turn or burn. Go in there and tell them. Turn or burn, buddy, that's it. There's only two options. What are you going to do? And Jonah was the one that was called upon to initiate contact. You see, the Bible in the Great Commission says, Go ye therefore huh, and make disciples of all nations. That means we initiate the contact. It doesn't mean we sit and wait. Uh, we are not keepers of the aquarium. We are fishers of men. Amen? Y'all with me? Amen? Some of you nodding gently, you know. Go ahead and just get loose up in here. It's okay. Uh, God knows your heart. 
It's all right. But listen, the bottom line is we need to understand what God's calling us to do. God is telling us to forget about the culture. God's telling us to, to forget about the opposition. He's telling us to rely upon Him, as He was telling Jonah in His commissioning. So He tells Jonah first the first action to take. He tells Jonah what to do when he gets there. And then He tells him why He's sending him. He tells him why He's sending him. Listen, He said, Their sin has come up before me. The grievous, stinking, putrefying smell of sin has come up before me. That's what he's saying. Now, that's grotesque, uh, but really that's what it is. And you see, that's, that's how God views our willful disobedience, as a, as a stench in the very nostrils of God. And, and God tells Jonah, he says, listen, you need to understand I have a purpose. The wickedness has come up before me. And that brings us to another point, really, that we have to understand, well, how in the world will they get rid of their wickedness? There's only one way. That's the word called repentance. And repentance is not coming and crying. It's not uh, saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is doing a 180 and turning from our sin and willful obedience to the will of God for our life. And, and what will happen when we do that, uh, then we will begin <clears throat> to take on that, that reflective device that we are to be uh, of God's glory, and people will look at us and they will begin to see uh, the person of Jesus Christ living in us, through us, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and we will be able to reach our culture and change it uh, for the glory of God. And that's what Jonah was called to do. He was given explicit instructions what to do, where to go, and what to do when he got there. And I believe the Great Commission spells that out for us as well. There was a problem, though. Jonah was called. Jonah was commissioned. But Jonah was carnal. And we see in the last verse the carnality of Jonah. Now, the reason we bring that up is it's in the Scripture, <laughs> number one. But number two, uh, that's put there for a benchmark for us to look at and to say, that's not how I want to be. Amen? Uh, but instead, to encourage us to understand when God begins to impress His will and His truth upon our life, uh, that we are not to be disobedient, but instead we are, we are to listen to Him, we are to hear Him, and most of all, we are to be obedient to Him in carrying out His will. No matter what it is, no matter where we're to go, no matter what He says to say, we're to sell out, surrender, and say, yes, God, I belong to you. You know, that's really the only response God wants to hear when He calls us is, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. You know, you, you don't see in Jonah's life here where Jonah has a say in the calling of the commission. In fact, there's not a word spoken in verse 1 or 2, uh, or even in verse 3, where Jonah actually responds verbally to what goes on. God just says, here's the deal. This is what you need to do. Let's do it. So we see the carnality in verse 3. But. But denotes a contrast from the very will of God. Instead of going with God toward the direction God called him to, Jonah went in the opposite direction. He said, oh no, God. And that's where the repentance piece comes in, you see. Because what happens is we're supposed to be walking with God in the same direction to accomplish God's will in our life for His glory. And, and, and what happens is when we leave off from the will of God and we say, oh, oh no, God, I, I don't want to go that way. We turn around and we walk the other way. Repentance is turning and walking back the way God called us to go and embracing Him for our way of life, you see. So when we see what, what, what Jonah did, uh, he, but he arose, he got up, okay, but he rose up to flee uh, under Tarshish. Uh, he went from the presence of the Lord, not in the presence of the Lord or with the presence of the Lord. He went from the presence of the Lord. Uh, and it says uh, that he went from the presence of the Lord and he went down. And let me tell you, that was a trip of degradation and that's where it began. It says here that he went up to flee. Uh, he went from the presence of the Lord and he went down to Joppa. Uh, now, geographically, I understand that's what they're talking about. And, and he found a ship going to Tarshish and he paid the fare thereof and he went down into it uh, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. 
But I'm going to tell you, not only, uh, not only did he uh, go geographically or, or, or directionally down, he went spiritually down. Anytime you turn from God, uh, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, right? That anytime we sin, the, the life-giving flow of the Holy Spirit of God is diminished in our life, and, and we no longer have the full capacity to honor and to glorify God as He has placed the call upon us and as He has commissioned us, but we're walking out of His will instead of in His will in the direction He wants us to go. And what happens is uh, we, we are going opposite of the, gate, the way that God wants, and we are in contrast of God's will. But Jonah rose up to flee, and he went in the wrong direction. You see, the Bible says in Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 1, If you then be risen with Christ, uh, seek those things which are above. As Christ said at the right hand uh, of God, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Uh, for you are dead in Christ, and uh, your life is hid with Christ in God. Let, let me give you a, a simple example of what that looks like. Are you ready? Here's God. Here's me. Here's Jesus. That's what He wants. That's as simple as I can make it. He wants us to be in His nail-scarred hand with the Savior. He wants us to be uh, embraced by God and protected and, and provided for by God as we go into the culture that we face to honor and glorify God with our lives. That's what He wants from us. That's what He wanted from Jonah. But Jonah got up the wrong way. You ever get on the wrong side of the bed in the morning? Who did that yesterday? Amen. Some of you ain't telling the truth again. That's okay. We'll have an invitation in a little bit. He went in the wrong direction, spiritually and geographically. You, you know what the scary thing is? He paid to go. Think about that. Think about that for a moment. Not only was he out of the will of God, not only was he carnal, but he paid to go. <laughs> he paid the fare. Uh, to flee from the presence of the Lord. And he paid the fare thereof and went down into it, the ship. He went down. He paid to go down. So, let me tell you, I, I heard it said in several messages, and I don't know who originally came up with it. Brother Herman may be able to help me out on this. But, but there's, a, there's a very wise saying in this, that, that I've heard several preachers use. He said, you remember, need to remember three things about sin. First of all, sin will take you further than you want to go. Number two, it will cost you more than you want to pay. And number three, it will keep you longer than you want to stay. Amen. I don't know who said that. And if I did, I'd give them credit for it. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, those are true statements, my friend. Those of us that have been out of the will of God, and I dare say every one of us, at one time or another in our life, uh, we know the penalty of sin. We know the pressure of sin. We know the persistence of sin. We know the, the, the debilitating effect of sin on our lives and our ministry. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, we get up and, and we as preachers, we, we think wrong things or we say wrong things or we do wrong things and we get up to try to present God's Word and you know what happens? It falls flat as a fiddle. Amen? It begins to floor, right? You can't sense the Spirit of God in it whatsoever. So what we have to do is we have to repent and turn back to God. We have to embrace the goodness of God. We have to be in the will of God. He got up the wrong way, he went in the wrong direction, and he paid to go. You see, the calling and the commissioning of God is a continuing effort from God. First he calls us salvation, sanctification, then he calls us specifically uh, into different areas, uh, but he calls us all to be baptized by immersion, and I believe he calls us to join a local church. Uh, I believe he calls us to, to deal with other dedicated servants of God in unison and unity under the umbrella of the local church. Uh, some of us will go to the mission fields. Uh, some of us will be evangelists. Some of us will do different things, again, under the umbrella of the, the local church. Uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, we are all called to honor and to glorify God. And, and what happens is when we lack godly character, when we're tem tem tempted and drawn away and, and trials come and, and we act in a carnal fashion, we're disobedient to God and we're no, of no heavenly value whatsoever. What do we need when it comes to that? I, I believe we need the Master's touch. Now, you may be sitting there this morning, you say, Brother Barry, I, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. Listen, I'm, I'm a Southern Baptist. Listen, I'm, 
I've trusted Christ. I've been baptized by immersion. My name's been on the roll at Parkview Baptist Church for 40 years. And that's good. Praise God. But I'm going to tell you, every one of us can get out of God's will. They said Jonah was a prophet. Think about that. Jonah walked close enough to God to hear God when God spoke to him. Think about that. Every one of us, every one of us has the propensity to get out of God's will. And when we get out of God's will, you know what we need more than anything else in the world? We need the master's touch. I, I, I read a poem, and I'm going to share it with you. Many of you know it. It's been uh, transcribed into songs and everything else, and it's by uh, Myra Brooks Welch, The Touch of the Master's Hand. "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worse, worth his while to waste much time on the old violin. But he held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks, he cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, then two. Only two, two dollars? And who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three. But no. From the room far in the back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin, he tightened the loose string. And he played a melody, pure and sweet, as caroling angels sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice quiet and low, said, what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with its bow. A thousand dollars, who'll make it two? Two thousand, and who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice. Going and gone, he said. The people cheered. But some of them cried, We do not quite understand what change it's worth. Swiftly came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like that old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He is going once. He's going twice. He's going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd could never uh, quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. You see, what Jonah needed, more than anything in his life at this very point was he needed the master to touch his hand. And he did. He did. Any time that we get out of the will of God and, and we discern that our will is greater than his, it will cost us greatly. It will cost us personally. It will cost our marriage, our finances. It will cost our church disunity. and Ultimately, it will cost uh, the kingdom of God. But the master is always ready. Sometimes that sin, we're like the old violin. We're dusty and dirty within. But Jesus said, come unto me all your weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. You see, God calls us all to the glorious bosom of his wonderful chair. And he tells us, come to him. Find the hope and the help that we need within. We can bring honor and glory to him in the beginning, midway, and even in the end. The invitation today is this. I don't know where you're at in your personal life, but there's a self-existent holy God who does. And he's calling every one of us to himself this morning. Don't let the but be in your response. You might be here this morning, never trusted Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible says if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Maybe we're here this morning and say, Brother Barry, I've been saved, I, 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 but I, I haven't been baptized. Well, make yourself a candidate for baptism. Maybe you're here this morning and, and, and you're not a functioning member of a local church. Parkview is a church that's going to go places for the glory of God. 
Maybe you need to come forward and join today. Or maybe there's something in your heart or your mind that you just haven't been able to let go of. Maybe it's something that, that you've been plagued with, or a habit or addiction or a chain that Satan has brought in to bind you with. You can find freedom today. You can find freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the the way maker. He's the chain breaker. Listen, he's the one who's able to do everything above and beyond that we could even begin to imagine. He's so great and so powerful and so wonderful. But we have to make the decision. We have to make the decision to surrender to his will, to do what he wants, his way. And when we do that, when we do that, my friend, he will open the doors wide open. Would you bow your heads with me today? As the praise team would come for a song. If you're here this morning, you say, Brother Barry, I need to come forward this morning. I've never trusted Christ as my personal Savior. And, and to be honest, with every head bowed and every eye closed, Brother Barry, if I died right now, I'm just not sure I'd go to heaven. I, I'm going to be honest with nobody looking around, everybody looking down. If that's you, would you slip your hand up and be honest before God? You say, Brother Barry, I'm just not sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Amen. Dealing with a house full of saints of God. Saint of God, as we sing the song in just a moment, this is a place, this altar, this, these steps of no disgrace. This is a place where you can come and, and pour your heart out to the Lord. He's spoken to you this morning. I challenge you, don't leave this place with dust and dirt, but make it right with God. Maybe there's somebody in your life in this building that you need to speak to today, and you just don't have the courage to do it. Would you come and ask God for it? Whatever the case is today, you allow Him to speak to your heart. If you need to come, you come. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for this day. God, don't let us off the hook. Speak deeply to our hearts today. Help us participate in your will right now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need to come, you come. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. promise good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures my 
chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior's ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace unending love amazing 